Our uh, speaker tonight is Mr. Fred Hatch. Mr. Hatch uh, served as a member of the U.S. Navy Armed Guard, which is the exact title of the group, right? That's it. Which is a little known uh, group of the uh, United States Armed Forces. The U.S. Navy Armed Guard was a service branch of the United States Navy that was responsible for defending U.S. and allied merchant ships from attack by enemy aircraft, submarines, and surface ships during World War II. The men of the armed guard served primarily as gunners, signalmen, and radio operators on cargo ships, tankers, troop ships, and other merchant vessels. Uh, disbanded following the end of the war, the armed guard uh, is today little known or remembered by the general public or even within the Navy. Uh, but without their courage and sacrifice, uh, during World War II, it would have uh, not brought much victory because I, I read someplace that almost all of the material uh, for the war, of course, was carried by merchant ships. And, uh, you know, you think of the Navy fighting all the time, but somebody had to bring that stuff from one point to the next, and that was a merchant marine. And my grandfather was in the merchant marine. Of course, he wasn't supposed to be, but he uh, joined up. Uh, a lot of things happened during World War II that weren't supposed to happen. People doing a lot of crazy things, but... Uh, and he got sunk, too. So, yeah, but he survived. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here, right? <laughs> Anyways, without any further ado, let me turn it over to Mr. Hatch, who will enlighten us further. Mr. Hatch, there you go. Thank you. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here tonight, especially such a distinguished uh, audience coming to hear an old guy like me uh, talk about what happened over 50 years ago. And if I'd known then, that I was going to have to speak tonight, I would have made a lot of notes and brushed up on my memory, because it's kind of hard. You say you go back to 1943 from 2010. That's a lot of water over the dam or under the bridge or whatever. And so my memory sometimes gets kind of faulty. I don't quite remember everything the way I had, uh, had I wish I did. I'd like to, uh, say thanks to my friend Kevin over here, who's the one that got me to be the speaker tonight. And uh, my daughter Cynthia came up from Columbus. She wanted to hear me t t tell what she may have never heard before. And my friend Corey over here is, I really appreciate having Corey here. Corey, I'm going to give you a hand, buddy. Uh, Corey's very interested in all historical things and watches the History Channel and the Discovery Channel on, on uh, television. One of the ways that we can relate to what the Armed Guard did was to imagine that you el got elected to provide for everything needed for a hundred family reunion. And this reunion was going to be taking place in a re very remote area out in Cook's Forest, Pennsylvania. And there's no water there. There's no groceries there. There's no uh, facilities there. So that means that for this 100 family reunion that you're responsible for, you have to get everything that's needed. You have to get the food, the latrines, the tablecloths, the make sure there's enough hot dogs. Uh, it may rain, so maybe you want to have uh, lots and lots of umbrellas and everything that's needed. So after you get all of these things, and make it, you, after you've made the list, and you've gone out and bought all of these things, and you put them in your garage, the next thing is to get them from here out to Cook's Forest. And that is uh, a task. If we relate that to fighting a war, a war that's a thousands of miles away in another land, and you make your list of everything you're going to need to fight this war, well, first of all, you need a lot of men. And when you have a lot of men, you're going to need something for them to eat. And you're going to need to have supplies uh, to replenish their uniforms when they're gone. They're, you're going to need bombs for the airplanes to drop. You're going to need the airplanes to drop the bombs. You're going to need high uh, uh, octane gasoline for those airplanes to fly. Uh, you're going to need K rations, C rations, 
uh, everything that is needed to fight a war has to be transported after it's um, manufactured here in the United States. It's got to get over to where the action is. Well, of course, the enemy doesn't want those supplies to get over there. If you can't get the bombs over there, they can't be dropped on Germany. And consequently, submarines headed for the Atlantic Ocean, and they were sinking merchant ships carrying these supplies right off the coast of the United States. In fact, the border cities in North Carolina could see explosions of the ships being hit by German submarines, and that was the task. The task was to get the supplies over there without ending up on the bottom of the ocean. In the beginning, the ships began to be armed with very ancient and very inadequate armor, and some of the guns that they had were uh, vintage of World War I. They didn't work very good. The sh and the ships that in the beginning were uh, armored with 50 caliber machine guns and 30 caliber machine guns. And that doesn't stop uh, a dive bomber or anything of that nature. So slowly the ships were uh, armored with heavier, uh, heavier guns. Um, we carried, and, and I say typical ships, I, being in the armed guard, I was a signalman. And the ships that we, that I was on had, uh, we had uh, load, uh, they had uh, five holds in a ship. And at least two of those holds always were full of explosive materials of one kind or another. And the rest of the holds uh, were everything that you could imagine with the jeeps uh, lashed onto the top of the ships so that every square inch of a ship was, was somehow um, used. The, uh, The uh, explosions that happened when you have a tanker with high octane gasoline or a ship loaded with explosives, when that ship is hit either by a torpedo, uh, by a bomb, or anything of that nature, it makes one big explosion. Consequently, the casualty rate for the merchant ships was quite high with 10 to 20 being sunk every day in the beginning. And uh, if you can imagine a thousand tons of explosive exploding, you can imagine one of the biggest fireworks that you have ever seen in your life. And consequently, the percentage-wise, the casualty rate in the armed guard was higher than Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force, the casual rate was extremely high. Um, when I was in boot camp at Great Lakes, this was back in 1943, I was 18 years old, and every night in the drill hall there were free movies, so that after you drilled all day, so you could go to a free movie, and I recall very clearly watching action in the North Atlantic. And as I left the drill hall that night, I thought to myself, that is one place I do not want to be is in the armed guard. Because it told of the, told of the, the trip to Murmansk, Russia, I believe it was Murmansk, which uh, suffered very high casualties. But guess where I ended up? I ended up in the armed guard. And that, uh, exemplifies or treats the idea that when you're in the military, you don't have much choice. You go where you're told to go, and you do what you're told to do, and there's no questioning about it. And if all of a sudden orders come through, we need 100 signalmen, 
then some of then they take 100 people say okay off you go to a signal school so that's what i was the uh, members of the armed guard uh, consisted of about 27 people there would be one officer who would be commissioned either he'd be an ensign or a second lieutenant and then there would be a gunner's mate and then there would be often a boatswain and uh, a radio man three signalmen and the rest were seamen who manned the guns the uh, ships had uh, as i already mentioned they had a three inch cannon on the uh, on the bow two three inch guns and a five inch cannon on the stern eight 20 millimeter guns uh, four of them were on the four corners of the bridge and the two on the starboard side and two on the uh, port side the uh, ships sailed in convoys toward the end of the war in uh, convoys of 20 to 50 ships and each ship had to stay in its position and uh, there was no communication between the ships by radio. We had a radio man aboard, but he w manned the radio to receive signals. He could not transmit anything because to transmit a radio signal would uh, allow the enemy to pinpoint just where the convoy was. The convoy would uh, travel at about six knots an hour. And that's pretty slow because that's about uh, seven miles per hour. And you can almost walk seven miles an hour if you walk quickly across that ocean. So you can imagine what wonderful targets these ships were just going at walking distance across the ocean to the enemy to uh, a, a sink. The uh, ships were completely blacked out at night and uh, so that it made it very difficult if you have 50 ships side by side front back all in formation and then it's a pitch dark night and there are no lights on the ship because the ships could not have any light whatsoever so you have you have these ships and if one bumped into another you could have a big problem so it was very difficult to on a dark night and I can remember very clearly one night they, there was a British sh uh, cargo ship ahead of our Liberty ship and for some reason he kept drifting back and when he got to about 10 foot from our bow I can remember so clearly the second mate cut loose and he called them it was a called them limey everything you could imagine to get that ship away from ours and so they would pull ahead and then pretty soon they'd be start drifting back again and uh, the uh, at night the ships were very hot because being uh, blacked out to go into the um, quarters of the ship where the mess hall was and that sort of thing there was a double set of curtains so you'd go through one curtain close it behind you then you'd open up the other curtain and then go on through and then close that so that every door had the two uh, curtains and uh, the portholes were closed and if you can imagine a ship and in those days there was no such thing as air conditioning a hot steel ship with everything closed down it was a hot place to be and uh, they'd have a, sometimes a little fan about that big to blow on you but it was just blowing hot air on you my job was a signalman and uh, I was on the bridge my duties all were on the bridge of the ship right where the captain the wheelsman and the mates were and uh, the uh, on each side of the bridge of the ship there was like a little catwalk going out maybe 15 foot going out on each side at the end of this catwalk there was a large a floodlight or spotlight let's just say but 
and it would be about this big around, and it had louvers inside of it. And if you press the lever, it would close those louvers. And by doing that, you could send Morse code. And maybe you've seen newsreels or seen uh, 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 accounts of nighttime Navy ships. You see a blinking light. Well, that's Morse code, and that's some signalman sending. And that was the only communication at, uh, during the night and during the day, although you'd never used it at night unless there was some severe emergency. The other kind of communication that you had were f signal flags. Every convoy had one ship, and it'd usually be the f in the first row of the convoy and in the center, and it would have a commodore aboard that ship. And the commodore was the boss of the entire convoy. And when he, he wanted to communicate with the rest of the ships, he would have the signalman aboard that ship run up on halyards, uh, and there'd be maybe four or five halyards at one time of signal flags that would go up. And as, you, as the other ships saw that, then they would run up the identical uh, set of flags, and that was their sign or their confirmation that they did receive the message. We had a code book on the bridge, and so when the flags were ran up, you went to the, your code book and deciphered it or decoded it to say what that message was to be, and then you would take that to the captain or the mate and say, here's the message that the Commodore is sending. Sometimes he would give orders to zigzag because there would be submarines in the area and it would be maybe a little different, uh, more difficult target if the whole convoy was going like this. And that was really something too. If you can imagine, and as I was preparing this talk, I was thinking of, of, a, um, of a football game when the band is out at the, in the halftime and they're going like this. And if you can imagine 50 large, large ships all in formation and they're all turning like this and like this and like this and the speed is changing and uh, to keep that all, all going, it's just beyond my imagination how they, they could do it, but they did it. And uh, the ships carried everything that was needed to fight the uh, mess hall, we shared the mess hall with the merchant marine. And I have to, if there's any merchant marine here tonight, I'd like to take my hat off to them. Because the merchant marine, I had mentioned that the armed guard, percentage-wise, had the highest rate of casualties of any of the armed forces. But the merchant marine beat the armed guard. The merchant marine had more casualties, percentage-wise, than any of the other branches of service, and more than the uh, armed guard even. The merchant marine were our buddies. We ate together with them. They were loaders on the 20 millimeter guns that we had, and so that you'd have, with eight 20 millimeter guns, you'd have uh, eight Navy gunners and then you'd have a loader who would be a civilian merchant marine so that they, the, in the, um, the ammunition, can't think of the name of it, the bullets would be in a container about this big. And so they'd shoot them out and the loader would then load, put another load in. Um, every invasion that was carried out had Navy or had Navy armed guard crews aboard merchant ships as part of that invasion. And so the, you had civilians who were captured and put in prisoner of war camps and were not given the same accord that military people were in prisoner of war camps. So many civilian as well as armed guard prisoners of war in Japan and in Germany. And uh, the, I just can't say enough about the, uh, the contribution that the Merchant Marine made in winning the war for us. 
the um, shifts we rode, we stood uh, we'll call them sh I'll call them a shift we call them watches would be four hours on four hour hours off which meant that you were on duty as a signalman from midnight till four o'clock in the morning and then at four o'clock in the morning you'd be relieved by another signalman and uh, then you'd be uh, uh, off until noon and then you'd serve be back on the bridge from noon until four in the afternoon and uh, or whatever there are four hour shifts and depending on what shift you had that's uh, uh, that's where that went the uh, we washed all of our clothes, and I thought I'd fill you in on some of the things. You see, sailors, at least uh, we, we had no laundry aboard the ship. So if we were, had white uniforms that needed to be washed, they got washed by flattening them out on the deck, and I bar of ivory soap and a scrub brush, and they were scrubbed on the deck and then hung up to dry. Or sometimes we would take a quarter inch line or r rope as a civilian call it, tie our clothes on it, throw them overboard, drag them for several hours behind the ship in the ship's wake and then pull it back aboard and, and hang it up and stretch them out a little bit and they came out very good. In the Navy, it's ama I'm still amazed at this, we rolled our clothes up and they never got wrinkled. They had very few wrinkles. All of your clothes were rolled and tied with little um, pieces of heavy, heavy twine or heavy string. And so that, and everything that we carried, we went aboard the ship with one trip and everything we had was on our back. Oh, we carried a, a, we were issued a hammock a canvas hammock and that became in a sense our suitcase because in, a, in the hammock you'd flatten that out when your mattress so you carried your own mattress with you then there were two blankets and a pillow and that would be rolled up with uh, in a long roll and then the rest of your clothing went into a sea bag and it's not quite as big as the army duffel bags it's maybe stood about that that high and about that big around with white canvas everything else that you had went in that uh, your socks your underwear your dress blues your work clothes because on board ship we normally wore just uh, blue uh, sh work shirts and blue jeans we call them dungarees then that's our was our do, do aboard ship clothes but we would have another set of uh, blues and then the dress blues and then a set of white blues our shoes extra pair of shoes dress shoes as well as work shoes and that all got then the the uh, hammock with the mattress and the blankets in it which was rolled and rolled that got wrapped around the sea bag and lashed so that when you put that up on your shoulder you had everything in your that you needed except you had a little ditty bag about this big with your shaving things in it and that sort of thing. But everything else, you walked aboard that ship with that on your shoulder and holding that small bag, you had everything you needed and everything you ever had uh, to have, including rain gear, sweaters, wool hats, wool gloves. It's just it's un unimaginable how much you could get in that bag to take with you and you carried it with you wherever you went. Um, I think that kind of gives you some idea of what the armed guard did. The very few people know anything about the armed guard. Even other uh, members of the U.S. Navy, they don't know what the armed guard was. Uh, and the newsreels always showed the battle wagons and the destroyers and they showed the bombs being dropped but nobody ever showed how everything got there in the first place and uh, there's one comment and I'll close with this and take any questions that you might have on one one trip that we made we took a lot of beer over 
and uh, as the there are two ships uh, when we were docked we were docked in Italy and uh, they were stern to stern and the there was cases of beer stacked on the ship on the outside in the, on the stern of the ship well the two uh, people on watch on the stern of the two ships that were stern to stern they were talking back and forth from one ship to the other and uh, the uh, on the previous trip I should say we had beer aboard too and we were up in southern Italy Leghorn Italy southern France Leghorn France with all of this beer and uh, the captain of the ship invited Cap we were all docked in a docking bay and he invited captains of other ships and the en chief engineer to come on over and they had a beer party so there was a lot of beer flowing on the next trip the same scenario but it was a different armed guard officer in charge and now we're in Naples Italy with two ships stern to stern and again we had a whole stack of beer going as high as your head all over the stern of the ship in the cases so they the, the man on our ship he decided he would be a do a favor and he'd transport some of the beer from our ship over to the other ship. And the uh, commanding officer found out about it and he was, he was boiling. And it, it was just, everything was so, uh, we did it before in the same, same fashion in Italy because we made several trips to Italy, Bari and Naples. Um, but this, on this particular trip, the commanding officer, he got so angry and nobody would say who was doing it, but it's real easy to figure it out because you know who's on watch and you know that uh, who had the keys to uh, be able to transport it, to get the, make it. And uh, so he, he finally found out and he told me, he says, when we get back to the States, you're in trouble. And so from that time on, the rest of the trip, nobody said any. He didn't say anything, and it was just a normal. But son of a gun, there he, as soon as we docked in New York, there was the shore patrol. They took the guy, and he was a good friend. I, uh, his name is on the tip of my tongue. He was, a, he was the nicest guy you could ever imagine. He just did one simple thing. The shore patrol took him, put him in the brig, and somehow he escaped. <laughs> And uh, they put him back on another ship, or he's able to get back on another ship. He threw all his stuff off, or off the dock and jumped off that ship, and they caught him again. And I don't know whatever happened to him, but I thought that was a dirty, a dirty deal for that, that commanding officer to, to do that. And uh, there was one other incident, and I'll, I'll close with that, and that's something that I wish I had a better memory, but I was put aboard a ship in um, New York, and it was under sealed orders. Now, once a ship is sealed, nobody can get on or off. And it's my understanding that the captain does not, at that moment, even know where the ship is going. So everything is complete secrecy. Well, we went to, we left New York. We went to Bayonne, New Jersey, to the oil docks to load up the ship with oil. And when we got there, it was decided that, well, maybe they'd better see if there's any mail for the crew before we leave, because that would be the last mail that uh, we might get for a long, long time. And being a signalman, and that signalman is communication, so I guess the idea was, well, it's a signalman's job. We'll t tell him to go over to the fleet post office and get the mail. So off I went. We were in Bayonne, New Jersey. It was, uh, at that time, it was about 4 in the afternoon, I believe. From where we were for the, from the oil docks, I had to take two trains for short distance, railroad trains, 
and to get to the uh, bay, take a ferry across the bay, and then, as I recall, it was three or four different subway transfers I had to make to get to the fleet post office. And at the, I got the fleet post office about, as I recall, it must have been around seven o'clock at night. Because, and as I got the mail for, that was all addressed to the crew on our ship, there was a telegram addressed to evidently one of the crew, and I was asked to read it to make sure that that was for our ship. Well, I read it, and here's a telegram from, uh, signed by a woman, and she says, Dear, we'll say John, I will be arriving at Grand Central Station at 8 o'clock, which would have been that night. So here I'm in the fleet post office. The ship is over in Bayonne, New Jersey, and nobody can get off. And I have this telegram. So uh, I go to the Grand Central Station. I got there about half hour before the train was to arrive. It did arrive on time. I arranged to have her name paged. And so she came, finally, we got together. And she was a young woman, as I recall, I don't, I, probably 21, 22 years old, something like that. She had made a long trip, and I believe she came from New Hampshire. And the, evidently, the train was not air conditioned, there weren't many. So she was looking kind of bedraggled at 8 o'clock that night in Grand Central Station. I explained the situation and said if she wanted, I could take her to where the ship was. And I didn't know if she'd be able to see her husband or not, but I'd take her. So she had said she'd like to go. So off we went. And as we're going, and well, backing up a little bit, as I'm making the trip from Bayonne, I'd never done it before, I'm memorizing all of the subway transfers I have to make, and the trains and everything, the ferry and everything. And as we're going back, retracing my steps back, I'm telling her, you know, here's a transfer, and I had this station, you transfer to this subway, and it, all of that sort of thing. So off we went, making all of these subway transfers, and by that time it was nighttime. New York City at that time was not like it is now, but even so, the sub the, some of the stations where we had to transfer, they'd be like deserted, there'd be one or two people there, and it was not a, I just didn't feel really 100% safe for to have a, two or three men being, other than ourselves, being in this whole place. But we finally made all the transfers, got on the ferry, crossed the bay, uh, waited for the one train, took that train, that stopped at a train station, and there was a waiting room there. And I would guess it must have been about 11 o'clock at night, 10 or 11, somewhere in that instance. So we had to wait for a train. So here we are, two complete strangers, sitting in a deserted railroad waiting room. There's just she and me and a cat. And I think we waited about an hour in that for the next train to come. The train came, we both got on it, we, we took us on to Bayonne, New Jersey, to the, and we took us right to the oil docks. And at the, where the ship was docked, there was a steep incline going down with stairways going all the way down to the, to the dock. And she was not allowed, to, of course, to go down where the ship was, very high security. So I told her, I says, you wait here at the top of these stairs, and by now it's late at night, I, my guess is 11 o'clock, because uh, we had to wait a long time in that deserted railroad station. And I imagine this girl must have been scared to death. <laughs> and uh, anyhow, I told her to wait. I'd go down to the ship and get her husband. Well, I went down, and it was a merchant marine who was her husband. I went to his where he was sleeping, and I'm shaking him. Wake up, wake up, wake up, your wife is here. He looks at me like, are you crazy? <laughs> so I explained the situation. I said, your wife is waiting up at the top of these stairs. So he got up, 
got his clothes on, went up, disappeared off the ship. I have no idea, and I kind of kick myself now for not being more curious, but because we were on that ship together for several months after this, and I never talked to him. I said, where did you go? Whatever happened? Or, I never asked him. I can't imagine why he didn't, because I have no idea what happened from the time he got off of that ship around midnight and meeting his wife up in the dark at the top of these stairs at an oil docks in Bale, New Jersey. All I know is that the ship sailed about 7 o'clock the following morning and he was aboard, and I, I don't know whatever happened after that. But I would guess that that was one of the biggest adventures that young lady ever had in her life. <laughs> well, for one thing, I kind of, as I look back, I think, gee, for a, a, a uh, see, I would have been about 20, but a 20-year-old raised in the country to never have been around New York, New York City a little bit, but not, you know, like a native. For a 20-year-old raised in the country down in Ashtabula County, making all those sweatway switches and doing everything that had to be done, and got her over there, and then I—I don't know how she ever got back. Frankly, <laughs> it was a complicated route to get back to Grand Central Station. I'll tell you that. I'll be very happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have. I hope that tells you something about the armed guard and something. Oh, one last comment. And I think of this every time I see a war movie. The actors in most of the war movies are old men. They're in their 40s. And you see an invasion uh, scene, and all the guys are, golly, they're, they're old men. World War II was fought by people like myself that were 18, 19, 20, 22 years old. And there was one man on our ship, I don't know how old he was now, he's probably 26 or 27, he was referred to as the old man. <laughs> but, and it, so the wars normally, now maybe, maybe the war in Iraq is, because it's a different army, but the World War II was fought by people that were 25 years old or younger. And so I went in, I was 18, and the little scenario that I just explained to you about finding this girl, I was an old salt by that time and I was 20 years old. I'd been in all the foreign countries and seen a lot of action and everything like that. I thank you for your kind attention and I'll be glad to answer any questions that you might have. I agree with you about the age of the people. Uh, I was 20 when I got in 1942 in the Army. And we were all around uh, early 20s, late teens, and even the officers were only like in their late 20s or uh, 30s or so. And w we had one guy in our outfit who was uh, 35. We called him Pop. <laughs> yeah. Did, did you all hear that? 35 years old and called Pop. <laughs> so as a young man, yes. How big were the ships that you were on? And how long did it take to get a convoy from North America, from the coast, to Europe? As I recall, I think, the size of the ship, I would guess, would be about three to four hundred foot long. That's my guess. As I say, if I could, at that time I never paid much attention to these things. I thought nobody would ever ask me a question like that. <laughs> and uh, the, the other question was? How long? Oh, how long it took. As I recall, it seemed like it took us about 10 to 12 days. Of course, they're going 24 hours, and even though you're going a few miles per hour, so to speak, it, it seemed like we got there. You know, I can't really remember. I, I can't, isn't that funny that you can't remember a thing like that? Was it tough coming back when they were empty? Tough coming back? Returning to the United States for another load while they were empty, and they had a load to keep them in the water? 
uh, you know. Was it Dallas? Yeah, when you care when you went back, they were empty. Was it harder to t take the trip back? Empty. Oh, empty. Um, usually, you take on ballast to to weigh the ship down a little bit. Otherwise, you'd be bouncing all around. Yeah, yeah. The, you'd, you'd have ballast in the ship to uh, weigh it down. It still stood out of the water because when you'd go over, your ship would be loaded. To, there wasn't much dis the space between the deck and the water was not a great, a great distance. And uh, I said, uh, should also mention there were some lifeboats, but normally they were life rafts aboard your ship so that they would slide off on a raft rather than a lifeboat. Okay. Yeah. Any memorable engagements with enemy ships or aircraft while you were on convoy duty? Would you tell me the question? Did you have any memorable uh, events while you were crossing with enemy ships or subs or aircraft? The, the question was, do I have any memorable events? I remember a ship was hit right next to ours, and the ship broke in two, just boom, right in two, and the front half of the ship went right down, boom. The last the back half of the ship stayed up, and I could see all of the sailors jumping off the ship into the water, and uh, and then I I was thinking, well, gee, the back half is staying up now, real nice. So <laughs> they probably the, the and that brings up another question or another thing. If a ship sunk in a convoy, nobody stopped to pick up anybody. The your ship, your convoy, well, you couldn't stop because you have all of these ships in formation and there was no way of stopping even if you wanted to. So the, there would be destroyers and destroyer escorts that would be constantly circling the convoy for submarines and it was their job, so to speak, to come in and pick up any survivors of ships that were sunk or that, you know, like this case where they jumped off the ship and I don't know what happened to those on the for forward part of the ship, but uh, convoys never stopped for anything. They just had to keep going because you're in formation. Eventually, were you able to fight the U-boats off better than at first? You said that 10 to 20 a day were being sunk. Was the, was the armed guard and the destroyer escort able to sink more of the U-boats waiting or...? At the beginning, you had the World War I armament, and then later on, you had the more modern, yeah. for, for 1942. Were you able to fend off the U-boats uh, and the other ones better? We saw periscopes, but uh, it wasn't until we were in the Mediterranean that we saw a U-boat uh, actually surface. They did not, they didn't service, a uh, U-boat did not usually a surface and if they did they could be fired upon but normally the only thing I ever saw were the periscopes. Where was your training at in the Great Lakes? At, well at Great Lakes Naval Station it's uh, between uh, Milwaukee and Chicago. How many uh, convoy or trips did you take across and were you always in the Atlantic and also were you always on a Liberty ship? I had, I was on, the question was, was I always, always on a Liberty ship and, or how many ships? How many, how many trips did you make? How oh, how many trips? I, I remember something like four trips on a Liberty ship. And sometimes I kind of, uh, I'm surprised myself because even though I was a young person, I didn't pay much attention to anything, and I didn't. I didn't get it. Maybe I'm. Maybe I'm odd, but I never got excited about things. I, it seemed like I just every day came and every day went, and you did what you're supposed to do, and and that's all that there was to it. And at the same, as I told about Rusking and this young lady from Grand Central Station, to me it was just a well, well, a whole hum thing. Here she is. I got to do it, and I'll take care of it, and. And then uh, that was the end of it, and 
I, that's probably why I never asked him whatever happened. Where did he? Have, there was no hotels around there. I know that. So, and I don't know. I suppose she got home to New Hampshire somehow. Um, but I guess I'm odd in a way because I never. I can't remember ever being frightened. I can remember when the water was, uh, and the waves were high, and the water it was so cold that the water splashing would freeze on the sides of the decks and the ships. And I can remember standing there talking to somebody, saying, well, boy, if we, if we had to be in that water, we wouldn't last five minutes, because it was so cold, and the, it was so, the waves or water was so violent. But then, you say it, and they say, "Well, we're not going to go any. We're not going to go in the water anyhow." And you go on about your business. So you don't even think about it. You don't worry about it. And uh, I can remember so many nights. Uh, I'd be in my bunk sleeping, or trying to sleep, and I'd hear the depth charges of the destroyers exploding, and I knew that there were submarines all around. But you don't give it, a, I don't know, I just never gave it a second thought. I said, well, i got to get some sleep. So you go to sleep and figure, well, let them take care of it. So, and as I say, I wish now, we were not allowed to keep it, to have cameras. We weren't allowed to keep diaries. But when I read some accounts in the, there's a magazine that's issued for the armed guard called The Pointer. And it has all kind of stories by other armed guard veterans and they say well at 3:45 a.m. on January this happened and he said this and I said I can't even remember where the heck I was at the, then because so he they must have kept diaries or else I don't know what but I wish I had a better memory that than I do and uh, it's uh, 10 minutes to 8 I really thank you for all of your kind attention I'm hoping now that if you ever hear about the armed guard or the, what the Merchant Marine did in the war, and the Merchant Marine finally were able to be buried in the National Cemetery in uh, Western Reserve uh, National Cemetery as veterans, although they didn't. That's one of the few perks that they, that they got. And I, I, oh, one last thing. There is a website, www.armed-guard.com. And if you go to that website, and that's armed-guard.com, you'll get more of the statistics than I could ever imagine or bore you with tonight. I wanted to tell you from my own aspect of what I remembered, and I, sometimes my memory isn't too good. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you. Great, thank you. Great job. Great job. Appreciate it.